Well, guys, welcome. Thanks for coming out. Um, this lecture is entitled, Did Jesus Die on the Cross? That's what we're going to be talking about. And we are videotaping this for the purpose of future ministry. There aren't a whole lot of folks in the room with us right now, but um, the videotape will be put on the Crossroads website, and our hope is to get that into the hands of more folks that we're with later on down the road. So this is still, you know, I hope this information will be useful to you guys. I'm, my name is Scott Tipton. I'm the campus director of Crossroads UT here at the University of Texas. And I am by no means an expert in the field of, of anything that's going on. I, don't, I haven't studied this for that long. You guys can see there aren't a lot of gray hairs in my head. I'm not old enough to be able to say that I'm an expert in anything, really. But uh, I've done enough research to know that what I'm going to say is true, at least. So I hope that you guys came with questions, and I hope that something comes out of this that's edifying and helpful to y'all. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I don't know very much, but I, what I do know is that in order for anything that I'm about to say to be of value, we first have to believe that the Bible is reliable, and that the Bible that we have today is the Bible uh, as it should be, as God intended it. So there's a previous lecture that Crossroads hosted here at the University of Texas. It was called, Is the Bible Reliable? A conversation with George Husney. Um, in that conversation, George went through and nailed down all the reasons why Christians today believe that the Bible is as it was back in the olden times. Um, I'm going to be operating as if that lecture convinced y'all because that lecture is really long and I don't have time to go back and rehash all those points. So that's a major presupposition that I'm going to give. If you guys don't agree with that supposition, then you should probably just stop now. Go back and watch that lecture again, figure out which points you disagree with, and uh, yeah, take things from there. But we're going to go ahead and, and uh, move on as if the Bible is truthful. And this brings us to another important question. Why is this topic important? The crucifixion and resurrection. I heard one time about a year and a half ago, um, a really dear Muslim friend of mine said to me, but why is the crucifixion important? Yes, we disagree on this topic, but I don't think it's that important. I think that Islam and Christianity are really close together. I think that they're more alike than they are similar. Why, uh, Scott, why do you insist on talking about this point of division and disunity as if it's, you know, as if it's a deal breaker? Um, well, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 17. It's up on the screen now. That verse says, And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him from the dead, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. The crucifixion and the resurrection are two principal aspects in the Christian system of salvation. You cannot take the crucifixion and resurrection out of Christianity and still have Christians. What you have if you take the crucifixion away is nothing. Because in order for uh, Christ to be the sacrifice that took away our sins... He had to first have died. His blood must have been shed, as it says in the Old Testament law, to pay for sins. Now that we've established that, here's a quick outline of what this talk is going to be. First, I'm going to hit what's known as the substitution theory, then the swoon theory, the legend theory, and then conclusion. We're going to spend the vast majority on, of this talk on the substitution theory. That's because it's by far the most widespread belief uh, in the Muslim world and throughout the world. That's because it's Sunni and Shia tend to believe, number one there, substitution. The swoon theory is more the nation of Islam and Ahmadiyya, and the legend theory um, tends to be later kind of philosophers and scholars. Some atheists are in the legend theory as well. We'll be talking about all this more when we get to each one. Now, I mentioned that the majority of Muslims and yeah, the majority of Muslims believe the substitution theory, and here's the reason why. It is written in the Qur'an, uh, the fourth surah, ayah 157, and because of their saying and boast, we killed Messiah, Isa, Jesus, son of Maryam, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, 
but the resemblance of Isa was put over another man, and they killed that man. And those who differ therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They follow nothing but conjecture, for surely they killed him not. From this, you can see, obviously, most Muslims who read the Quran would believe that Jesus was not crucified, but that someone else was placed on the cross in his stead. Pretty logical conclusion from that verse. Um, so in order to talk a little bit about this and what it means for the crucifixion, what I'm going to do right now is an American would attack this subject head on from a historical analysis, a uh, historically analytical point of view, but I'm going to take more of an Eastern approach and start with philosophy. Now, what I'm going to say initially is that Muslims and Christians both believe that Jesus was a prophet. Christians obviously believe that he was a son of God. Muslims believe he was just a messenger. But Christians, well, both of us believe that as the son of God, he did not sin. But let's look at what Jesus says. If the Bible is reliable, what Jesus says is true. And in Matthew 16, 21, Christ said, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Remember, this is not just Joe Blow saying this. This is Jesus. And again, he says in John 12, 30 to 32, this is Jesus speaking. This voice was for your benefit, not mine. This came after, um, I believe it was after he was baptized. The voice of God spoke from the heavens and said, no, it's not. It's too late in the Bible. I'm not sure at what, after which event this happened, but the voice of God came from the heavens and uh, spoke to the crowd. Jesus says about the voice, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. The Bible says that he said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. These are just two examples, and they're two examples from two different Gospels, which run in two different streams. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels. They follow one stream of witness, and John follows a completely different, means that it had its origin in another place. Someone else entirely wrote it. Um, and this shows, because one is from Matthew and one is from John, and there are many other examples in the Bible, that Christ was saying this often. Christ is showing that he came down to earth in order to be killed and in order to draw him into himself after he's raised up. Here in John 10, 18, he's speaking about his life and the sacrifice that he'll made. And he says, no man takes it, meaning his life, from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This means that Christ was willing to go to the, go to the cross. It was his purpose. It was the reason why he came. Um, and we have to question that because if he is a prophet, if he is the son of God, in either case, in either case, he's sinless. So what's going on here? Is he, does he not understand what he's saying? Is he lying? He obviously can't be lying. That's a sin. Okay, does he not know what's happening? If the Bible is true, then we have to take these statements and do something with it. So the substitution theory means that Christ failed. If it is true. Because if God were to take Jesus off of the cross at the last moment and substitute another man in his place, it means that God is preventing Jesus from fulfilling the mission that God sent him to do. That doesn't make sense. There's something a little iffy with that. Now, um, there will be a, a review of all the points that I'm hitting at the end. We'll talk about it a little bit more then. We'll move on to number two of the substitution theory. This is the different accounts of the crucifixion. Now in Luke 23, 33, it says, When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. This is one account. Uh, this is obviously a Christian account of the crucifixion. This is a Jewish account of the crucifixion, completely independent. There were no overlap between the two uh, sources. It's the Talmud. The Talmud is a large depository or a large accumulation of Jewish teaching and Jewish law. In the Talmud, you can look at the Sanhedrin 43a and you'll find it written, 
On the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, who is Jesus, was hanged. Hanged is how they said crucified. Since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of the Passover. So the Jews believed that Jesus was crucified. From a Roman source now, from a completely independent third source, this one is another one. The Jewish source and the Roman source sources both uh, denied the sonship of Christ. They were not Christian sources. And the Roman source from Cornelius Tacitus, who was a professional historian of the time period, uh, in 15 verse 44, Christus, who is Jesus, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Now we see three completely independent sources, all from the first or early second centuries, all corroborate the same report about Christ. There are not consistent reports that contradict the crucifixion. Now I'll say that again. There are not consistent reports that contradict the crucifixion. There are people who say different things about the crucifixion from this time period. You can look back and find stories, uh, people guessing about what happened, people say, telling a different tale, but there are not multiple independent reports that match one another that say that Jesus was not crucified. The historical record shows clearly that people believed this event had taken place. Now, the first thing that I'll say is uh, in the Quranic verse, it does say that and those who differ therein are full of doubts. If we look back at it, it'll say something like, they have nothing but conjecture, they, you know, etc., etc. It's talking that the number of people who do not believe, no, who do believe that Jesus was crucified is not unified. The historical document doesn't show that. The record shows that there are many consistent, independent reports that all match one another to say that Jesus was crucified. Muhammad also... It must be noted, most apologists do say that um, he came along 600 years after the event itself had taken place. Now, obviously, Muslims believe that Muhammad received a message from God. Okay, that's great. But 600 years is a little too much to be historically significant. That's like me saying, now, commenting on the bubonic plague, or commenting on... Christopher Columbus's journey across the, um, across the Pacific Ocean to discover America. Now, I'm in 2013. That happened in 1492. I can't, I can't tell you what that was like. So, that's all I'll say about that. I don't like to talk about Islam. Um, <laughs> so, what I'm <laughs> the point that I'm getting at here is that uh, these multiple independent accounts of the crucifixion, all these people that believe that Christ was crucified, there was no school of thought that declared someone else was crucified. It's not like there's one theory that it was Christ on the cross, and there's another competing theory that it was someone else on the cross. Everyone believed that Christ had been crucified. And that brings us to a difficulty with the substitutionary claim. Because it's impossible to directly prove Christ's crucifixion. We cannot go back in time and I cannot go back and touch Christ's hand and ask him questions that only Christ would know or do something in that way to prove that it was Christ on the cross. Even if we could go back in time and look at the cross, according to the substitutionary theory, then the thing on the cross, whatever, whoever it was, it would look like Jesus, so we couldn't even prove it that way. It's a claim that has to be based on blind faith, and that sits a little uneasily, I think, with a lot of people. There's much written about that. I think that um, it's safe to say, if God were giving us a claim, it's safe to say that we should expect him to back it up with some historical evidence, I think. I think to demand proof from God is not being too demanding. <laughs> I think that we should expect our God to be logical, to have something more than blind faith for us to stand on. Now, it is impossible to directly prove that Christ was the person on the cross, but we can look at what happened immediately after his crucifixion to show what people believed again. 
Now, the early church was absolutely centered on the crucifixion to the extent that they were martyrs for their faith. Let's look at why. To be an apostle, one must have physically seen Jesus resurrected. That's a high standard. That means that Paul, Matthew, Mark, Luke, James, all the 12 apostles had to have physically seen Christ resurrected after his death. That means that in the scriptures we see a huge emphasis placed on what we have seen and what we have heard and what we have touched. You'll see it in 2 Peter 1.16. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. This is a soft example. There are many times when the apostles declare, we have seen the risen Christ. We have seen this man. We, have seen, we saw him alive. We saw him be crucified. Then we saw him raised from the dead. This is a soft example. 1 John 1, 1 to 2 is a much more, more vibrant, more descriptive example. And I actually had to cut this verse short. If you look at it in context, it continues on with uh, the apostle declaring that he saw this, that he was intimately familiar with it, physically familiar with it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. Okay. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This means that he's not proclaiming something theoretical. He's not proclaiming something that's based on blind faith. He's saying, and look at this, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. He's saying that when Jesus was crucified and died and then rose from the dead, the apostles not only touched him before his death, they touched him after his death. He rose and came to them to prove his resurrection, to prove his sonship and his divinity, that he was God. And let the disciples touch him and be friends with him and talk to him. He ate with them. There's an instance when he ate fish and bread with them, just chilling on the beach, you know. There are uh, examples like this all over. So we have to ask, did the substitution theory exist at this time? Before Muhammad came, was there anyone that believed the substitution theory could have existed? There was no party that claimed that the crucified man was not Christ. There is no documentation for any theory competing with the crucifixion of the Lord. Now, there is one very small Muslim school which has looked at this historical uh, evidence and has tried to jive away through it. It states that three parties emerged immediately after Christ's crucifixion. The Muslims, who claimed that... Uh, the substitution theory, who claimed that Christ was taken up by God and a replacement was placed on the cross. The Nestorians, who claimed that Jesus was the Son of God. And the Jacobians, who claimed that Jesus was God himself. So the difference between the Nestorians and Jacobians was that the Nestorians believed that the Son of God was crucified. The Jacobians believed that God was crucified. That's the only difference. And Christians, I know you're kind of sitting in the audience scratching your head because you're like, yes, they're both right. But, okay, it's a big difference. Um, they believe that shortly after Christ's crucifixion, or, well, somebody's crucifixion and Christ's ascension, the Christian parties conspired together to kill all the Muslims so the teaching disappeared. That's how they rally around this thing. That's how they explain it away. Obviously, there is no historical evidence for this claim. There's no school that has emerged saying that Christ was not on the cross. It's an idea that was invented when Muhammad came. It was not present prior to Muhammad's arrival. Okay? Now, the next thing that we have to look at for the substitution theory, remember there's going to be a review of all of these points. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this. We'll be able to hit it again soon. Resurrection appearances. Now, this slide touches on it briefly. The next slide is going to hit you with a whole truckload, so be ready. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. This is not even a complete list of all the resurrection appearances of Christ. There are several more. Christ was popping all over the place after his death. Now, it's interesting also that if we look at uh, this, it says, most of whom are still living, right in the middle of this quote there, right after the brothers and sisters at the same time. What does that say? And that means Paul was asking his readers to go and talk to the people who saw it firsthand. Because that's how Christianity spreads. Christ comes into me. I experience him. I feel his love. I feel the way that he changes my life. And then I go find somebody else and I tell them about the way that Christ has changed me. These people were still alive at this time. It was possible to corroborate the reports. This is what Paul is saying. Go talk to the people who saw it firsthand. <laughs> go see if I'm lying. Go check the facts. Go ask questions. It's significant that no contradiction arose. There was no unified body that said, Hey, man, I just talked to Michael. He's a guy that you said Christ appeared to, and he doesn't know what's going on. Nobody said that. Because they did their, they did their fact-checking. They went to the people. They asked them if Christ had appeared to them, and they said yes. Now... Another question that we have to ask if we're analyzing the issue from all sides is if the substitutionary theory is correct and if God took Jesus up, um, up away from the scene and made another look like Jesus so that that man would be crucified instead of Christ, then why did Jesus return to earth? You'll see, first bullet, if Christ was not killed, why did he appear again? And why did he commission his disciples in the way that he did? If the Bible is true, as there is extensive, overwhelming evidence that the Bible has not changed, if the Bible is truly uh, pure, then why did Jesus say what he did in Luke 24, 46 to 48? This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is one account of what's known as the Great Commission. Luke 24 is the last chapter in Luke. This is after Christ has risen from the dead, now that he's standing with his disciples in one of his resurrection appearances. He tells them to go preach in his name to all nations, baptizing them and making disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the version in Matthew. Now, if Christ was not killed, then why is Christ returning to make these claims? Is it, it must only be that the Bible has been changed, but we have seen that the Bible has not been changed. Again, there's something that doesn't jive. So let's go back to a summary of substitution theory, a summary of everything that we just talked about. Now, Jesus, whether you believe he's a prophet or the Son of God, in either case, he's sinless. It is clear that he predicts his own crucifixion and his own resurrection, and he declared it his singular mission. He declared it God's will for him to come die for the sins of the people. There was no other reason why he said he would come. So was Christ lying? Is it possible that Christ did not know or did not understand why God had sent him? Or was it a correct, correctly fulfilled prophecy? Now, number two that we hit. The message of the early church was consistent and unanimous, that Christ was crucified and raised to life. There was no evidence that anyone ever believed someone other than Christ was killed until Muhammad came. When Muhammad came around, this was a brand new idea that he propagated that he spread. And the third idea, that Christ appeared many times after his death. So if he was not killed, why did he return to earth and tell his disciples to go make disciples of all nations? Now, thank you, JT. Um, we'll move on to the second, uh, the second part of this. These next two are going to go much quicker than the first. 
Some schools of Islam teach that Christ did not die on the cross, but rather swooned. To swoon means that you pass out or lose consciousness, faint. And uh, after his swooning, he recovered and appeared to the disciples. Basically, it's saying that the resurrection appearances happened, but they were wildly blown out of proportion, and they don't represent the actual fact. Um, the two major sects that teach this theory is the Ahmadiyya sect of Islam and the Nation of Islam. Both of these sects are regarded as heretical by mainstream Sunni and Shia Muslims. Nonetheless, um, in the interest of true apologetics, we've got to touch them. So, we'll attack the swoon theory from two angles. The first is historical. Now, in order to talk about whether or not Christ could have survived the crucifixion, we have to talk about what the crucifixion was. In a standard crucifixion, First, Christ would be stripped to the waist, his shirt would be taken off, he would be naked from the waist up. There would be a whip, a whip is a thing that you sling, with a bit of jagged lead or sharp bone at the end of it. They would whip him about 40 times with that. Now, just to give you some perspective, an idea on what that would do to him. This is a medical doctor's interpretation of the whipping. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin, and finally spurting arterial bleeding from vessels in the underlying muscles. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which the others cut wide open. Finally, the skin of the back is hanging in long ribbons, and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. He survived this. Many would die from the whipping alone in a crucifixion. They would leave many carcasses in the first stage. Many would not even make it to the cross to die there. They would be dead before they even walked that distance. But after the whipping, Christ survived. He was forced to walk to the place of execution, which is about 650 yards. Remember that the Romans tried to make him carry his own cross, as most uh, prisoners did at that time, but Christ was too weak, so they forced someone else to carry his cross for him. After that, when they arrived to the place of the execution, the Roman soldiers drove spikes into Christ's hands and his feet, and they hung him on a cross. Now when you're up on a cross, what you actually die from is asphyxiation. You can't breathe. You ha you're forced to push yourself up by the legs to take a breath because your entire weight is hanging right here. It's hanging on your shoulders. It makes it to where your rib cage cannot open. So eventually, whenever the victim gets so tired that he can't push himself up again, he drowns in midair. He dies by strangling, if you will. Now, keep in mind that Christ died soon, but he was up on the cross for six hours. This was a man who was so exhausted, he could not drag his own cross 650 yards. He survived this. Finally, to top it all off, a little strawberry on the top of the cherry pie that we're building, rather gross cherry pie, a Roman guard came along to make sure that Jesus is dead, and stabs Jesus in the side. Jesus is hanging like this. The spear comes from below, the cross is high, and comes like this near his heart. Now, this alone would kill most men because in the area that, um, in the area that he had to have been speared in order for blood and clear fluid to flow, it would have been very close to his heart. He would not have bled out which would have been safer. If he would have bled out, that would have been better. But it would be so close to his heart that it would bleed into the chest cavity, making a hemorrhage, which is bleeding inside of the body. Very difficult to stop, even for modern medicine. You only have a few minutes to live. But when this Roman guard pierced Jesus' side right here, blood and pericardial fluid emerged. This is what's read as blood and water. Now, our good friend... Ahmed Didat 
has taken this verse to mean that Christ did not die on the cross. Ahmed Didat is the most well-known um, propagate or supporter of the swoon theory. Ahmed says that um, Jesus was not killed because when he was stabbed, blood and water flow out, showing that he was still alive because of one medical journal that was published in 1949, which states that there is an average of something like 100 cc's of pericardial fluid, and this number does not change after death. That journal was published in 1949. You can, if you have a book by Ahmed Didat, you can go to the sources and you'll find that journal sourced. But I, can, you know, I don't need a master's degree in philosophy to tell you that 1949 was a rather long time ago. <laughs> We have, we have a little bit more modern, more accurate knowledge now. And we know that a normal heart has 20 cc's of pericardial fluid. So my heart right now probably has around 20 cc's. But with 20 cc's, if somebody stabbed me from the bottom going up, in order to make a perfect canal to where that pericardial fluid and my blood would flow out through the hole, it's next to impossible. 20 cc's is just not enough. To give, uh, to give the Roman guard a chance to hit it. It's not big enough. But after a ruptured heart, after a man dies and his heart ruptures, then the cavity where his heart is fills with 500 cc's of pericardial fluid, meaning that it would be very easy for a Roman soldier to come thrust, hit the general area of the heart, and have pericardial fluid flow out. So rather than showing that Christ did not die, this shows very clearly that Christ was dead. Now, the last bit when we're talking about the swoon theory is that Rome of that day was like America of this day, in that their army, their armed forces, were the envy of the entire world. They were the greatest military power of the ancient world around Christ's time. Uh, if a Roman soldier failed to kill a prisoner sentenced to death, he was killed. So, to put that in another term, if a man was sentenced to be crucified and the four, four, remember four, <laughs> Roman guards that were in charge of him failed to see him dead by the end of two or three days, then they were killed. Now, there were four highly trained killers attached to each man sentenced to be crucified. Come on. <laughs> you think that four men want to die? Rome had the greatest, most disciplined army in the world. So who would stop these four killers from doing their job and making sure that it was carried out to the fullness of its completion? Another one theory that has been forwarded is maybe the disciples bribed the Romans. But I'm not sure if there's enough money to bribe me away from killing an executed man when I knew that if I was caught, my punishment would be crucifixion. In other words, let me say that again. If the Romans did not crucify Jesus, they would in turn be crucified. They knew the strength and the discipline of their friends. And they knew that if they were sentenced to be crucified, they were done for. There's not enough money in the world that would convince me to cheat on this job. In addition, the disciples were famous for their poverty. So them having enough money to bribe the Roman soldiers into forfeiting their own lives seems, seems pretty unlikely. Now, from a philosophical point of view, this is my second approach against the swoon theory. If Christ had returned bruised and bloody and the disciples had nursed him back to health, would they have hailed him as the Son of God? So if Christ in his resurrection appearances had showed up with a flayed back, with blood dripping all over him, exhausted, dehydrated, near starved to death, would they have hailed him as the Son of God? Would they have established a new church? Would they have, would they have called him God in the flesh? I don't think so. Would they have gone to their own martyrdom as they did? All of the apostles were killed, every one of them for their faith. And I don't think that they would have been killed if... Um, if they had seen Christ as a bloodied and bruised man rather than the Son of God resurrected. Now, this third, this third theory, I'm hoping to get through this really quickly. 
Some schools of Islam believe that the entire event of the crucifixion never occurred, that Christians invented it years after Christ's natural death. This is a theory that has also been forwarded by some atheists. Um, literally, when I'm making this part of the slideshow, I just copied and pasted from earlier in the presentation. <laughs> so, earlier on, uh, we talked about different accounts of the crucifixion. We took three different perspectives, a Christian, a Greek, not a Greek, a Jewish and a Roman perspective, and we put them next to each other to show the variety of sources that Christians have to point to the truth of the crucifixion, and I'm just going to do the same thing here. The Jewish, uh, the Christian source is Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. From a Jewish source, the Talmud, um, from the Sanhedrin 43a, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu, Jesus, was hanged, crucified. Since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of the Passover. And finally, from a Roman source, Cornelius Tacitus. Uh, in 1544, Christus was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate. Three entirely independent sources. Again, there is no evidence to contradict the crucifixion's occurrence, meaning that there is no argument that uh, would count as a historical testimony that Christ was not crucified. There are not... There is not an independent stream of argument saying that Christ was not, that many people have flocked to, is what I'm trying to say. hope that made sense. There are many, many documents from the early church with clear, unified theology, um, meaning that they all preached Christ crucified. What this is saying, the legend theory states that Christ's crucifixion and resurrection was a story invented by the disciples after Christ's death. But we see from the early church they preached from the very beginning Christ crucified, resurrected to pay for their sins. There was a clear and unified theology all throughout the development of the early church. So, in conclusion, uh, I left it really open-ended. Was Christ crucified and why? And what does the crucifixion mean today? Remember our presupposition that the Bible has not been tampered with. And uh, thank you so much for coming. That's all that I have. Thank you guys.